Hello YouTube. Uh, we'll just do a few pages of this book, which I started a previous episode on. Uh, this will be episode two, obviously called The Virus of Jihad, which is the shortest path to paradise. I'm going to be jumping to page seven. Please download the book, read it yourself. I will put a link in the description so you can actually read this for yourself and see what Muslim scholars actually think. Again, this is a highly qualified scholar who has studied the major Islamic sources, studied the life of Muhammad, knows what he's talking about. However, before we begin, let me show you a couple of slides that I found on Islam QA. As you know, Islam QA is the largest Islamic advice or fatwa site on earth. It has something like 330 to over 400 million views per month, so roughly one quarter of the entire Islamic world which is roughly what 1.5 billion technically visit this site each month so they reach a huge audience who believes what they read here i'm not saying one can necessarily believe everything the imams write here about some of the more controversial topics however it's interesting to see what they say and they do concur with some of what i have been showing in my episodes my question is, can you kill a disbeliever who does not accept Islam? Please tell me in detail with simple English and understanding. It is not permissible to kill a disbeliever if he does not accept Islam. However, in a situation of jihad, if the disbelievers are conquered, they will be invited to Islam. If they refuse to accept Islam, they will be ordered to give jizya. If they refuse to pay jizya, which is the tribute paid to the Muslims so that they don't fight you, then only will they be killed. Repeat, if they refuse to pay tribute to the Muslims, then they will be killed. Uh, this is from Mufti Desai, a fellow South African of all things. Yeah, makes me proud, makes me proud to be South African. Thank you, Mufti Desai. Next one, let's have a look and see what they say here. I have a question about offensive jihad. Does it mean that we are to attack even those non-Muslims which don't do anything against Islam? just because we have to propagate Islam. Wonder where he got these ideas, maybe from, ooh, I don't know, jihad in the Sharia? For the sake of Allah, includes the propagation of Islam. Now, remember, we often hear the term jihad fi sabil Allah, which means jihad in the path of Allah, sometimes translated as jihad for the sake of Allah. And this includes the propagation of Islam. These are some of the compulsory, obligatory, mandated tasks for Muslims. So, for the sake of Allah includes the propagation of Islam, the survival of Islam, and, interestingly, the extermination of those hindrances which impede the progress and the expansion of Islam. If a country does not allow the propagation of Islam to its inhabitants in a suitable manner, or creates hindrances to this, then the Muslim ruler would be justified in waging jihad against this country so that the message of Islam can reach its inhabitants, thus saving them from the fire of Jahannam. If the Kafir allow us to spread Islam peacefully, then we would not wage jihad against them. Again, Mufti Ibrahim Desai. Thank you, Mufti Desai. I, I really appreciate your forthrightness here. That uh, yeah, makes me really proud to know that I've got a fellow South African writing such nonsense. Sadly, though, they believe this. Do not forget, jihad is not just about violent warfare. There are many different kinds of jihad, including jihad of the sword, jihad of the pen, jihad of the mouth, the tongue, jihad of money. So we need to be very careful about what's happening because there will be propaganda, there will be infiltration, there will be lots of things besides just the violence that we see. But it does say if they're allowed to spread Islam peacefully, in other words, if you submit to their demands, they won't fight you. But if you just don't roll over and play dead, they will wage jihad against you. I thought jihad, as we were told by Linda Sassur and so many others, that uh, jihad is um, self-improvement, you know, having more salads, helping little old ladies cross the street. It seems that, uh, yeah, that may not be entirely accurate if what we read here is correct, especially coming from a mufti. So please look this up on Islam QA. Now, back to the book. I left off previously on page 8, and we should go through to about page 12 or so. Different types of jihad. There are two types of jihad against the kafir. There's the offensive jihad, which comes first, and defensive. Let's read a bit more about offensive jihad. This is when the Muslims launch an offensive attack. If this attack is on the kafir who have previously received the message of Islam, 
then to call them towards Islam before commencement of the attack is considered preferable, not compulsory, not obligatory. If the message of Islam has not reached them, then the Kafir will be invited towards Islam. Again, not necessarily compulsory. If you've watched my shows on Logos Media, on the Unspun discussions on Islam, as well as on Reasoned Answers, you will see where I discuss that they can make the call, and if they did not make the call, there is no penalty. They may still attack you regardless. If they reject this true faith, then they will have to pay jizya, the kufr tax. This is tribute paid to the Muslims, so that you will not be further attacked. If they refuse to submit to the payment of jizya, then the Muslims are to fight them. Again, refer to those episodes on the Reasoned Answers Apologetics channel and on the Logos Media Unspun podcast. I especially have discussed the Hadaya, which is one of the very most complete Sharia manuals, and I've read through the laws there in detail. And those laws are still current. Nothing has changed. With this type of jihad, the Kafir who plot against the Muslims are repelled and their hearts are filled with fear so that they do not succeed in their plans. The offense of jihad is fard kifaya. This is a communal obligation, an obligation that falls upon the entire community of Islam or the Ummah, the purpose of which is to ensure the Kafir remains terrorized and away from mischief, thereby allowing the message of Islam to be conveyed without obstructions. This seems to line up with some things that we just read on Islam QA. How coincidental. If one group of Muslims fulfill this obligation, then it will be sufficient on behalf of all Muslims. But if no Muslims fulfill this obligation, then everyone is considered sinful. It is stated in Fatwa Shami, it is required of the Imam, the leader of the Muslims, to dispatch the army routinely, once or twice a year, towards Kafir countries. It would seem that offensive jihad is obligatory and they're required to fight. Interesting, so maybe ISIS had it right. I actually was reading some things last night discussing ISIS. The disagreement was not over the doctrine of ISIS, which is 100% compliant with the Sharia, 100% perfect, normal, standard Sunni Islam. The issue was that they went ahead and did it without the support of the entire Islamic ulama. The issue was just that they went ahead early. It is also the duty of the Muslim public to assist the Imam in this noble cause. If the Imam does not send an army, then he will be considered sinful. Oh boy. The majority of jihad undertaken at the time of our Prophet Muhammad was within the category of offensive jihad. Because it's a religion of peace and Muhammad was a man of peace, in fact, he was a man of peace who had lice living on his head. As we can see here, Muhammad was the perfect man and uh, Zainab, she was picking lice from the head of the Messenger of Allah. An incredibly clean man who had lice living in his head. Yes. Islam for the win. Now moving on. The Quran has called upon the Muslims to undertake the offensive jihad, and when this obligation is satisfactorily fulfilled, there would be no apparent need for the defensive jihad. Ah, so they attacked us first to prevent us from attacking them, in case they, we realized that they were going to attack us and we attacked them to defend ourselves, they need to attack us first. I get that. When Muslims neglect this important obligation, then they are subjected to the defense of jihad, and this has become, with regret, widely common in our time. Now, you have to note the word obligation here is a legal term in Islam, Islam being a legal system. It's imams being lawyers, they are legal scholars. Watch my most recent episode on the Reason Dancers Apologetics channel this week. I discuss this. Defensive jihad is when the Kafir enemy attacks the Muslims. Okay, fine. Well, anyone and everyone has the right of defensively protecting their homeland, their borders, the integrity of their nation, their sovereignty from attack. That is no surprise. That is nothing new. However, offensive jihad is something that is, well, the Nazis did it and... Yeah, Islam does it. You work it out. So jihad is considered fard ayn, or a universal obligation, or a personal obligation under the following conditions. When the imam, the leader of the Muslims, orders the Muslims to go for jihad. The explanation of fard ayn is that every person will go for jihad to such an extent that the son will march forth without the permission of his father, the wife without the permission of her husband, the debtor without the permission of the creditor. 
Normally, these obligations prevent them from engaging in jihad. But this changes things. The jihad becomes fard, which is obligatory, firstly upon all the Muslims in the immediate area, and if they're not sufficient, it is obligatory upon the Muslims in the next town or country to assist. If they are not sufficient, then it will be fard upon the next country until the fard extends from the east to the west. Makes you glad that Islam is an ummah and they all get together and join hands in jihad against the West. That's, that's good to know. Jihad in the Qur'an. The subject of jihad has been discussed with particular emphasis and in considerable detail in the Qur'an. There is consensus of opinion amongst the researchers of the Qur'an that no other particular action has been stated in such great detail as jihad. Many surahs primarily guide the believers towards this path. The subject of jihad has been expressed in many ways in numerous verses of the Qur'an. The verses explain in detail the clear objective and benefits of jihad. Many verses warn of the dangers of leaving jihad. There is such great emphasis on this subject that some commentators and scholars of the Qur'an have remarked that the topic of the Qur'an is jihad. The terminology of jihad fi sabil Allah, which means jihad in the path of Allah, has been used in the Qur'an 26 times. And the word kital, or fighting, is used in the context of fighting in the path of Allah, is mentioned 79 times. The whole surahs in the Qur'an, which have been revealed, explaining the ruling and the virtues of jihad. I would prefer to think of it as the virus of jihad, because we're dealing with the Quranovirus. And it admonishes those who leave jihad, such as Surah Anfal, consisting of 10 whatever that is, and known as Surah Badr, and Surah Bara'a, which consists of 16 whatever the heck those are. The Surahs Bakra, Nisa, and Ma'ida have large sections on the topic of jihad, and in the Surah Hadid, the weapons of jihad is detailed. There are Surahs which are named after battles, like Surah Azhar, Battle of the Trenches, Surah Qital, Fighting, Surah Fat, Victory, and Saf, the Battle of the Rose. The title of these surahs clearly illustrates the subject matter of jihad. In Surah Adiyat, an oath has been taken on the horses of the Mujahideen, and further in Surah Nasr, worldwide revolution. Yeah, that sounds like um, like something to look forward to. It's like, um, yeah, the communist revolution, the Nazi revolution. Yeah, sure. This sounds great. And the spreading of Islam has been mentioned through jihad. Well, there you go. Islam spread by the sword. The truth is that a Muslim who reads the Quran with devotion is determined to reach the battlefield in order to retain the reality of jihad. It is solely for this reason that the Kafirs conspire to keep the Muslims far away from understanding the Quran, knowing that Muslims who understand the Quran will not distance themselves from jihad. It is a religion of peace. Repeat after me. They're going to kill you because it's a religion of peace. The next topic here is Jihad in the Hadith. I will discuss that in the future. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, please leave your comments below. Um, let me know what you think if you'd like to learn more about this. Anything else you'd like me to cover. Please look at my long form shows on the channels that I've mentioned. Please just keep repeating that Islam's religion of peace and hope they don't kill you. Thanks. Goodbye.